And when she finished, all I said was this. From the time you started talking to when you just finished, I disagreed with everything you said. That's all I said. Months later, the Ferris employee and I are in another city trying to raise money for the museum. And she brought up that incident to me. And she said to me, I am so disappointed in you. And by the way, a lot of sentences start that way when people are talking to me. I am serious about that. So I got to wait to figure out what they mean. And she said, I am so disappointed in you. She said, when that woman said what she said, all you said was that you disagree with everything she said from the time she started to the time she finished. That's all you said. I said, well, what was I supposed to say? She said, you should have brought the same passion, the same vigor, the same commitment <coughs> that you bring about African Americans and Latino Americans and all these other, and women, and all these other people. You should have brought that same passion. And you did. And I said, well, why didn't you say something? Because I'm not above getting defensive. I said, why didn't you say anything? You didn't say anything. You were standing right there. She says, I couldn't. She says, you are a fool. This is pre-Chief pre Diversity Officer life. She said, you are a full professor and one of the voices on our campus. And you had what it took to speak had I spoken, I could have gotten fired. I could have, do you know what it would have looked like if I would have said, got into an argument with her over gays and, and not, and being gay, this would have gotten out and it would have been bad and I could have lost my job. And I said, are you kidding me? You stand up for yourself, don't put that on me. Talk for yourself. And she says, and, and I'll tell you what, she looked at me like I'd just fallen off a turnip truck. Like I was just so naive. I'm going to tell you a few things. If you forget those other things I told you, you don't forget this. It should never take courage to speak. Ever. Any situation where it takes courage to speak, the situation is wrong. You follow me what I'm saying? Listen to that. It should never take courage to speak. Ever. If it takes courage to speak, the situation is wrong. You're in a camp somewhere with guns at your head, or you're in prison somewhere. In the normal flow of a society, it should never take courage to speak. That's number one. Number two, don't ever let somebody take your voice from you. Ever. Ever. When you lose your voice, there is no you left. It's like an onion that's been peeled. There's nothing left but the stink of the onion. Don't ever let anybody take your voice from you. Period. Number three, there is no diversity without dialogue. None. Zero. Zilch. Low. I wish I knew some more languages. <laughs> there are no, there is no diversity without dialogue. We must be, as a university, able to talk about anything. I sent out a campus-wide note, and all it said in there was an opinion that, in my opinion, as the chief diversity officer of this institution, we ought to at least start talking about having domestic partnerships. Good Lord. If you can't hold that conversation at a university, where can you hold it? She was a good woman. She's passed away now, gone on to her reward. And the fact that anybody took her voice from her is a bad thing. When you listen to a racist joke, you take the voice away from somebody. When you listen to a sexist joke, a homophobic joke, an anti-Muslim joke, any of them, you take the voice from people and you give them a voice that's not theirs. Stand with people. Speak for people. That got too serious, so I gotta tell you like a quick note. Is that okay? Don't just look at me like, uh, you know, if I, I could be ignored at home, so. <laughs> <laughs> We're 
We're almost done. I was in a racket club. I wasn't going to tell you this story, but I got to. I was in a racket club. And this guy came up to me. He wasn't that good a tennis player either. Again, I was good in tennis. All right? <laughs> Until I tore my Achilles tendon. That, don't laugh at that. That's true. So he comes up. And in those days, people used to get drunk in racket clubs. Isn't that amazing? They smoke and get drunk in a racket club. He comes up to me. He's, he's been to the vineyard a little too long. So he comes up, he's all oiled up, and he says to me, did you hear the one about the Polish such and such? And I just stopped him. And I said, man, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear that. And he looked at me and he says, are you Polish? So me being the wise guy that I am, I said, yeah, I'm Polish. <laughs> and I'm German. And I'm Haitian. And I'm Chinese and Japanese and Filipino. And so, and Pretty soon you run out. You think you can name a lot of them, but you run out. <laughs> so years later, I'm giving a talk at Big Rapids Public High School. And you know when you give public speeches, it's like when Dr. King ends with, I have a dream. By the way, I have a dream part. That's not his speech. That's the poem at the end of the speech. Anyway, to be a speaker, you've got to have this big thing to end on. So this was going to be my big thing I end on. So I started telling this story at, at Big Rapids High School. And of course, I might have embellished a little bit. <laughs> and so I started, this guy comes up and he says, are you Polish? And I go, yeah, I'm Polish. So by this time, I've learned the names of many countries, right? So I'm like, yes, and I'm Chinese, and I'm Japanese, and I'm Jamaican, and I'm Haitian, and I'm Italian, and I'm Irish. I go through this whole list. And then I says, and I'm a woman. <laughs> <laughs> and then just for extra effect, and I says, and I'm gay. <laughs> so then we got to the question and answer part of it. And the student stands up and he says, Dr. Pilgrim, of all the things you are, is it most difficult to be gay? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, son, do you know what a metaphor is? <laughs> and he said, no, son. And I said, then it's most difficult being gay. 